Far from Mark Twain's Mississippi riverboats lies Quarry Farm in Elmira, New York. But it was here that for 20 summers he came to write his most famous books. From the sanctuary of his hilltop, he looked down on the valley of the Shemung River, which always reminded him of his boyhood home. Here, he wrote such classics as The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, Life on the Mississippi, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, and many others. And here, today, people come every summer from all over the world to the spectacular Elmira College Domes to see a musical biography celebrating America's best-loved author, Mark Twain. It's good to be back at Quarry Farm. I want to thank you for being here. You give me a chance to talk. And the truth is, I never get bored hearing myself. My wife tells me I've turned her into a good listener. And that's probably true. But she has performed nothing short of a miracle on me. To appreciate that, you'd have to know where I started. And how unlikely it was that I'd be climbing these steps up to Quarry Farm. If you have a minute, I'll tell you about it. Wait there. I wonder if anybody is... Uh, anybody home? No, oh, well, well, they'll be in later. My birth in the little village of Florida, Missouri, was quite inauspicious. And yet, since our village only contained a hundred people, I increased the population by one percent. Which is more than many of the best men in history could have done for a town. Four years later, we moved to Hannibal, Missouri, on the banks of the Mississippi River. It was a boyhood paradise, and I never tired of writing about it. Tom! Tom Sawyer! I patterned Tom after someone I knew very well in Hannibal, myself. Now, Tom Sawyer, you've played me tricks enough. Every plank, mind, and don't you miss a one. And me, a boy, and wanting to we're go fishing. Going, we're 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 going, fishing, fishing, fishing. You're up a stump, ain't ya? Must got Grandpa riled up something awful working on Saturday. You call this work? It ain't work at all. You don't mean to act that on that you like working on Saturday. Yeah! Well, I don't see why I oughtn't like it. Does a boy get a chance to whitewash a fence every day? And thought of that! It does look kind of interesting. Hey, Tom, let me whitewash the fence. Just a little. No, no. I reckon it hardly do, Ben. You see, Aunt Polly's awful particular about this fence on the street, you know? It's got to be done very careful. I reckon there ain't one boy in a thousand, maybe even two thousand, can do it the way it's got to be done. No! Is that so? Yup! Oh, come on. Can I have a try? Just a little. I'd bet you if it was me. I'd give you the core of my apple. Well... Here. No, but I'm afraid. Okay, I'll give you all of it. All right. You got another brush, Tom? And yeah, thus began yeah. the slaughter of the innocents. Tom traded patent opportunities for a kite in good repair, a dead rat and a, a string to swing it with, 12 marbles, part of a Jew's harp, a key that wouldn't unlock anything, a tin soldier, a couple of tadpoles, six firecrackers, 
a brass doorknob, a dog collar, but no dog, and four, one, two, three, four pieces of orange peel. He also had a nice idle time with plenty of company, and the fence had three coats of whitewash on it. Tom Sawyer. Hi, everybody. Sure, anybody paint that but me. Now, where's that boy got you? Tom? Tom? So done it. Now, Tom, don't lie to me. I can't bear it. I ain't it. It's all done. I never. Well, go along and play, but mind you be back sometime in a week or I'll tan you. You call us work, it didn't work at all. Not for you. It's not your brains, it's ten feet tall. How does he do it? You want to know my favorite wish. What's that? Carefree days of boyhood were over when my father died. I was 12 years old. My family couldn't afford to keep me at home, so I was sent away to a newspaper as an apprentice. I set type for them, and they gave me board and clothes. More board than clothes, and uh, not much of either. After five years, I'd set enough type for a lifetime, and I started to think about a profession where I might make some money. Now, when I was a boy, there was but one permanent ambition among my comrades in our village, and that was to be a steamboatman. So by and by, I ran away. I said I wouldn't come home again until I was the pilot on a steamboat and could come home in glory. That young dreamer I wrote about in Life on the Mississippi will always be a part of me. Pilot on the Mississippi is all I ever want to be. The master steersman of a river boat with a soul unfettered and free to hear the hails from the plantation. Children cheering from the shore as we go rolling into New Orleans. Who could wish for anything more? Childhood friends, fare thee well as I journey. I've set my tack and I won't turn back from today. Come what may, I'll live and die upon the river amid her changing reefs and bones. stars and steer a course through the stars through the stars 
Mr. Bixby, how'd you like to learn a young man the river? I wouldn't. I mean, apprenticing, leading on to a license. That's what I figured. Boy, there ain't a tad whacker going. Don't think piloting's just standing up in the pilot house, being admired at by the ladies, carrying a gold watch and tapping a bell. There's more to it than that, a heap more. I expect there is. You do, huh? You drink? No. You gamble? No. But I could learn. You swear? Not for amusement. Only under pressure. You tell the truth when it's put to you. You mean do I lie? Yeah. No, sir. Well, now and then I tell a whopper or two, but only when there's no harm in it. All right, boy. What's a leadsman? A leadsman tests the depth of the water with a long piece of rope and a lead weight tied to the end of it. Why does he do that? See if the water's deep enough for the boats to go through the sandbars. And then he calls out the depths to the pilot as loudly as he can so there's no mistake. Mr. Jefferson, I would be gratified if you would sing out some of your leadsman's calls so that this uh, boy here can tell me what he thinks they mean. Why, I'd be happy to oblige you, Mr. Bigsby. Mark one. One fathom, six feet. Shallow water for a steamboat. Might be a reef. What a last twain. About ten feet. Getting deeper, but still dangerous. Mark twain. Two fathoms. And that's safe sailing for a steamboat. Well, I reckon Horace Bixby is your man. And I reckon Sam Clements is going to be the best cub you ever had. At least, I'm going to try to be. Now, don't you worry about that. When I say I'll learn a man the river, I mean it. You can depend on it. I'll learn him, or I'll kill him. Come on, boy. I thought I'd follow the river for the rest of my days. But the war came, commerce was suspended, my occupation was gone. So I went out west with my brother Orion to do a little prospecting. I prospected for gold, silver, copper, lead, iron, coal, quicksilver, granite, marble, chalk, and plaster of Paris. After seven years as a miner, I was a total failure. So I became a newspaper reporter instead. It was then that I started signing pieces Mark Twain. Now all Mark Twain needed was some notoriety. When Joe Goodman, my editor, asked me to cover the first official tour taking Americans abroad, he didn't have to sound the bugle twice. 28 days later, we stood in magnificent Paris. We few, we happy few, we innocents abroad. Now, the first thing that any self-respecting tourists do is to find themselves a guide. My two companions, Dan Slope, Charlie Langdon, and I, we hired ourselves a Frenchman named Bill Finger. At your service. We soon changed his name to Ferguson, on account of that sounding more French. Uh, perhaps we could prevail upon Mr. Ferguson to conduct us to one of the wonders of Paris. Certainly, I am here for this. Gentlemen, this is where the famous Carcone stone. It is one of the wonders of Paris. I don't think I should be seeing this. No, 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 we can't watch this. I've heard about this. It's disgraceful, shocking. Women show their legs more than their legs. No well-bred American male. No, 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 we have to leave at once. I covered my eyes for very shame, but I looked through my fingers.
This ought to give you something to write about. Well, I'm not going to tell them what you think. What then? I'm going to tell them that by far the most beautiful women I've met during this trip were born and reared in America. <laughs> Charlie, what you looking at there? Someone who was born and reared in America. May I see? Oh, sure. Very beautiful. Her name's Olivia. She's my sister. Your sister? Charlie, will you do something for me? Of course. When we get home, I promise you'll introduce me to your sister. Sure. There was nothing for it but courtship in earnest. I set to and finished my first book, The Innocents Abroad, about my overseas excursion, delivered it to the publishers, and turned all my energy and attention on Elmira, New York. To be precise, on 21 Main Street, the mansion that Charlie's mother and father like to call home. Well, I find Mr. Clemens to be very entertaining, but slightly wearing. Those Western manners of his are a constant surprise. He only requires a certain dusting off every once in a while. Charlie tells me that his profanity is rather colorful. He's always controlled himself in my presence. Well, I'm sure he has, but it seems to put him under a terrible strain. What Elmira needs to boost her economy is a tourist attraction. Something to bring people here from all corners of the earth. I'm afraid there isn't anything like that in the environs of Elmira. Well then, uh, create something. What about a statue to Adam? You mean Adam as in uh, Adam and Eve? Absolutely. Father of the human race. Why, with Mr. Darwin's new theories, there's every possibility that the world will accept the monkey and discard Adam. Or his very name would be forgotten. Elmira mustn't waste this opportunity to do Adam a favor and herself a credit. While the commercial potential is enormous, he'd bring in millions of dollars. Billions! I think it's a wonderful idea. After all, we have as much right to claim Shimung County as a site of the Garden of Eden as anywhere else. Of course, we should change the statue's necessary uh, fig leaf to uh, a tobacco leaf in honor of Big Flats Tobacco. Mama, Mr. Clemens tells me he plays the piano. Oh, <laughs> Don't you? No, you wouldn't want me banging away on your nice piano there. We insist, Mr. Clemens. Uh, after all, uh, who knows how long it will be uh, before we have the opportunity to hear you again. Well, if you like, uh, I guess I could uh, pick out a little something here. <clears throat> Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. I look to... Uh-oh. Uh, maybe I shouldn't sing this kind of oh, song here. Oh, please go on. Uh, that was very nice, Mr. Clemens. Uh, I'd better make sure everything's underway for our trip to the station. Charlie, I don't know. Yes, want... I'll help you. Mother, I have something for you in the kitchen. Really, yes, dear? dear? Uh, well, all right. I haven't a moment to lose. I, I better come to the point immediately. Oh. I love you, and I want to marry you. Mr. Clemens! Oh, no, it's not enough to say I love you. I, I'm entirely bound up in you. You're in my thoughts constantly by day. You're in my dreams by night. 
You become so completely a part of my life, stop of my it. very flesh and blood and stop bone. Stop it, Mr. I... Clemens, you must stop. I... I can't allow you to say those things to me. You... You must understand, my feelings are not the same. I don't love you. And I never will be able to love you. Oh. Oh, how typical of me, just to rush in headlong with no thought for your sensitivity. Dear Livy, please forgive me. I, I'm so grateful to you for the kindness and consideration that have been shown me ever since I came under this roof. It's been the one period of my life with no regret. And I don't regret that I love you and will always love you. I accept the situation uncomplainingly, hard as it is. Better to have loved and lost you than for my life to remain the blank it was before. Mr. Clemens, you... You hardly know me. How can you be so passionately in love with me? Well, it seemed I knew all about you when I saw your portrait. I saw beauty with a gentle heart and a generous spirit. I, I saw perfection. No, you... You saw a timid young girl with a frame around her who is very far from perfection. Please. Idolatry is an impossible burden to bear. Oh, the last thing I want to be is a burden to you. I, I do want to idolize you, that's true. But anybody who saw you would fall under that spell. You're the nearest I'll ever come to refinement. I simply don't know what to say. Say that you'll allow me to write to you, and, and that you'll write me something from time to time. Uh, texts from the New Testament, if nothing else occurs to you. Uh, uh, say that you'll think of me uh, as a brother, and perhaps you'll come to love me as one, too. I never can or will love you, but I'll make a Christian of you. Oh, and let us pray that in the meantime, you will dig a matrimonial pit and fall in it. Mr. Clemens. Uh, um, you see how much I need you? I, I'm just always saying something that, that ought to embarrass me. But it doesn't, because I just don't know any better. But you know better. Oh, would you just say you'll take me on and try to make a gentleman out of me? I shall endeavor to dust you off every once in a while. Everything's ready. Oh. Well. Goodbye, Mr. Clemens. Dr. Gray, oh, ask him to come immediately. I will. No, no, right. don't try to save me. Just let me die. Does it hurt so badly? Pity is for the living. Envy is for the dead. Oh. A pilot on a riverboat must have an excellent memory. He must also have cool, calm courage that no peril can shake. <coughs> oh. <coughs> Here you are. He seems a little improved. Well, he should be. Our youngest daughter has devoted her whole life to him. Oh, Jervis, I'm worried. <coughs> Your mother thinks I'm coarse, doesn't she? Yes, she does. Well, I suppose I am. But you see, the only women I've ever known were the ones that I met prospecting out west. And they were... Oh, um, they were... More uh, worldly than I? Uh-huh. 
worldly, exactly right. There's a proposal in the air. I know it. I know it. You're needlessly concerned, my dear. Libby isn't impetuous. Yes. I will be Mrs. Samuel Langhorn Clemens, with my father's permission. We have to find out more about him. Jervis, do something. I shall ask him for a list of references. And I'll write to every one of them. Uh, do it before he leaves on his lecture tour. Charles Stone took his little seven-year-old son with him to Chicago. Now, during the trip, he reminded the boy now and then that he must be on his best behavior there. He said, We shall be the guests of the clergymen and their wives, and you must be careful to let these people see by your walk and conversation that you are of a godly household. The admonition bore fruit. At the very first breakfast which they ate at the Chicago clergyman's house, he heard his little son say, in the meekest and most reverent way to the lady opposite him, Please, won't you for Christ's sake pass the butter? A bohemian from the sagebrush a jailbird, a bail jumper, a deadbeat, and an alcoholic. There's a great deal of consternation here. Each day's mail brings another enemy in our midst, in the form of a reference. Clemens is a humbug. Oh, Charlie, it isn't possible for them to get any worse. Harvard University is a wondrous place. In a museum there, they have two skulls of Christopher Columbus. One when he was a boy, and another when he was a man. <laughs> With no business head, he frequently puts what money he has into wild brain schemes, which always fail. Suppose you were an idiot, and suppose you were a member of Congress, but I repeat myself. Your father will be apoplectic. We cannot allow this marriage. We simply can't. My mother looks on my love as a disease that she hopes will pass away. I don't think it will. Oh, um, I, I've been having an experience today, and it results in this maxim. To man, all things are possible, except one. He cannot have a hole in the seat of his trousers and keep his fingers out of it. <laughs> We've had the answers to the references. Yes. They weren't exactly what was expected. No. Mr. Clemens, what am I to do? You claim to love, Libby. I do. You are a stranger to us, and she is our treasured daughter. 
We feel overly protective, perhaps, but that's because, physically, she's not strong. You do know that about her. Yes, of course I do. Look, Mr. Langdon, I admit I have been through the world's mill in all its follies, frauds, and vanities. But I've lived that life, and I don't live backwards. God doesn't ask the returning sinner what he has been, but what he is and what he will be. I admire your courage for not denying your past. Frankly, when I read these letters, I thought you hadn't a friend in the world. You're probably right. Well, I'll be your friend. I know you better than they do. Take the girl. If there is one individual creature in all this footstall who is more thoroughly, uniformly, and unceasingly happy than I am, I defy the world to produce him and prove it. In my opinion, he doesn't exist. Not only was I a happily married man, but I was also a successful author. My book, The Innocents Abroad, had been selling so well, it took 16 presses and a paper mill to keep up with the orders. <laughs> but my success didn't seem to impress the established East Coast literati. The Innocence Abroad is only bringing Clemens money, not literary prestige. Bret Hart is going to be remembered long after Mark Twain's brief notoriety. Let Twain write his books in Elmira, wherever that is. My wife consoled me by giving me two beautiful daughters, Susie and Clara, and then baby Jean. I adored the baby, of course, but she fell out of favor when she appropriated my study for her nursery. My wife soon solved that. She built another one for me. sits on an elevation commanding leagues of valley and city and retreating ranges of distant blue hills. And when the storms sweep down the remote valley and the lightning flashes above the roof over my head, imagine the luxury of it. And it's inspired a new book, which I have had no more trouble to write than I do to lie. I'm going to read the first few pages of it to the family tonight and then turn them over to Livy to expurgate, as my daughter Susie calls it. Wish me luck. Auntie Cord, Auntie Cord, are you going to play with me? What? On the Holy Sabbath? No, on the porch. <laughs> now, Susie, you are to sit perfectly quietly as Papa reads his story. Did the study work its magic, Sam? Well, I trust you to be the judge of that. <laughs> Sit on Papa's lap. I don't think... Well, sure, darling, that's oh. all right. Come on, I've saved a place for you. Now, this book is about a boy called Huckleberry Finn. You don't know about me without you read the book by the name of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, but that ain't no matter. That book was made by Mr. Mark Twain. That's Papa. And he told the truth mainly. <laughs> there was things which he stretched, but he mainly told the truth. 
Oh, Papa, you must always tell the truth. Mm. Well, the children hate lying, you know. Well, they did not uh, get that inconsistency from me. Oh, do go on, Sam. <clears throat> he told me about my father. He used to lay drunk with the hogs in the tanyard and whoop me till I was all over with welts. But then he disappeared. One day... I seen somebody's tracks. I didn't notice anything at first, but next I did. There was a cross in the left boot here made with two big nails to keep off the devil. I was off in a second. I didn't lose no time. The next minute, I was spinning downstream to Jackson's Island. Jim! Huck, what is you doing here? I'll run away. What are you doing here? Well, maybe I better not tell you. Why, Jim? Well, there's reasons. But you wouldn't tell on me now if I was to tell you, now would you, huh? Blame if I would, Jim. Well, now, I believe you. Uh, I run off like you. What? You can't run off like me. You belong to Miss Watson. Yeah, well, she was going to sell me into the south, into those cotton fields. And I couldn't have stood that, Huck. He told me he'd hit a raft in the willow cover and was going to run away on that. The raft rush, Jim. Jim never said another word. But the way he worked to get that raft ready showed how he was scared. There is one thing about rafts, though, Jim. They float the current downstream. So we've fallen right into those cotton fields you run from. Well, I know we is, Huck. But I didn't know what else to do. Who knows what kind of trouble I'm in. I heard a preacher say once you go to help helping a man steal herself. Perhaps you shouldn't have left in the first place, Jim. You win someone else's property. But there's free states out there, Huck, for people like me. With the help of the Lord, I'm going to get there somehow. Oh, no, there's a place where a man can be free and never feel troubles or woe. I know there's a place that is waiting for me. And that's where I was wanting to go. A man's got to live with a dream in his heart and know that the dream can come true. I'll be free Somewhere I'll be free I hope you will, Jim I know we ain't got much But right now we got the whole river to ourselves And look, there's a candle in that cabin window Pretty, ain't it? <laughs> You know, I've never been out on the river now. You ain't. <gasps> well, look up in the sky, all speckled with stars. Do you reckon all those stars was made? Or did they just sort of happen? Well, they just sort of happen. I judge it take too long to make so many. Well, the moon could have laid them. Yeah, I see the frog lay most as many. Yeah, the moon probably later. <laughs> no, sir, Huck. You know, I've got to believe the Lord done it, Huck. He's looking out after you and me. He's going to help me to get away. Then I'm going to buy my wife, my little child, out of slavery. Take them home to live with me. i got to believe it. Oh, man's got to live. Oh, 
dream in his heart and know that the dream can come true. And I know the Lord's been with me from the start, and someday he'll lead me to freedom, a life of freedom. story, Sam. Uh, well, it'll be even better when you get through editing it. I don't think there is a happier man alive. I just hope that I can always keep things financially secure for us. Well, of course you will. Your books will be bought for as long as people read. <laughs> My only concern is when you neglect your writing for other people's creations. But other people's creations are so miraculous. Like this wonderful new machine I've invested in. What machine is that? A typesetter. Sam, how does it differ from the other things you've invested in? Oh. Like the steam pulley, the carpet pattern machine, the elastic vest strap, and the self-pasting scrapbook. None of them have made you a penny. As your financial advisor, it's my duty to tell you that this contract you are about to sign, guaranteeing completion of the typesetter, can bankrupt you. But the typesetter will revolutionize printing throughout the world. It'll make us millionaires. Oh, Sam, this obsession you have with wanting to be a millionaire, I don't understand it. You've already earned enough money to do anything you want in life. Well... Or as long as I can remember, I've had this dream that one day I'd be fabulously wealthy. The machine is poetry and power, the brass and steel fulfillment of the century, and Mr. Clemens, you will be indelibly associated with it. Well, never mind. In six months, that typesetter's gonna make us wealthy beyond our wildest dreams. We'll be able to do anything we want. I may even give up writing. Oh, Sam, that's exactly what you shouldn't do. Six months. You'll see. Don't sign that contract. Oh, look. There's a full moon. And the reflections turn the Shemung River gold. You see? That's a sure sign we'll have real treasure soon. Oh, we already have it, Sam. Right here. You won't regret this, Mr. Clemens. When the machine's finished, it'll take... Ten men to count the profits. I expect Susie is waiting to say her prayers. Uh-huh. Well, I hope she doesn't ask for a pony again tonight. If she keeps that up, I may have to buy her one. <laughs> well, I'll go and tuck her in. That way you won't have to hear her. The typesetter didn't come together as fast as I thought it would. In fact, I was six months and six years off target. Mr. Page, the inventor, was obsessed with making the machine perfection, and I was bound by contract to provide him with the money he needed. My family never complained, even though I had to keep them on very tight rations. But my friends rallied round, and on my 55th birthday, they gave me a party. My finances continued to be so limited that Susie put her allowance back into the family coffers and then gave me a present more precious than any money could buy. Now, Clara, are you sure you don't need someone to help you turn pages? I'm fine, Susie, really. Oh, I just want everything to be perfect, that's all. I know, it will be. Don't worry so. Oh, here they come! Oh. High upon a hill There is a lovely farm Where children laugh and play Their world is free 
Now, I thought this was supposed to be a dance. I've seen you in your white suit on a formal occasion. And it won't be the last. I've dubbed this my don't care a damn suit. <laughs> Clothes make the man. Naked people have little or no influence in society. <laughs> I've been so worried lately because you seem to have given up your writing. I've been a little preoccupied. With the typesetter? Yes, and making sure the publishing company is a success. The typesetter is almost perfection. I only have to take it apart just once more. The New York Herald is ready to place an order. Only a few more months. Papa, it does bother me that so few people seem to know you the way I do. They think of Mark Twain as only a humorist, joking at everything. Now, humor sets the thinking machinery in motion. It's mankind's great blessing and what gives me my belief in the human race. Clemens can't continue to pay you. You're ruining him. We have a contract, Mr. Whitmore. Papa, and Susan has offered to lend the money to send me to college. Well, there's no need. Now that Huckleberry Finn is published, if the critics like it, the money will come in again. Oh, Papa, I know that from this night on, everything's going to be just the way it always was. And I should tell my readers that as for Huckleberry Finn, if Mr. Clemens cannot think of something better to tell our pure-minded lads and lasses, he had best stop writing for them. Trash and suitable only for the slum. Mr. Clemens seems more concerned with the rights of Negroes than the rights of literature. Huckleberry Finn is coarse and dreary, subversive and immoral, totally without humor. It must be expelled from the library. Mr. Clemens, you and the publishing company are bankrupt. I shall try to persuade the creditors to accept 50 cents on the dollar. Well, thank you, Whitmore, but my wife and I are determined that everyone shall be paid back the full amount. I know, I know, I am a great and sublime fool. But then I'm God's fool. And all his works must be contemplated with respect. I was forced to uproot my family and move to Europe, where our expenses would be halved. I vowed to stay there and write until every penny was paid back to the creditors. Even though it meant we had to leave Susie behind. Before we left, Livy prayed that we would all be together again soon. I turned around three times and threw salt over my shoulder. You look after her, Katie Leary. I, 
I know I'll have peace of mind if you are with her. Well, of course I'll look after her. I don't mind how I look in the eyes of the world, but I do mind how I look in your eyes. Oh, Papa, you look like the bravest man I've ever seen. Mm. I am the cause of the separation of this family. Oh, no. We'll be together again soon. And just think what we'll have to talk about. You'll have been to Europe. And I will have been to college. Scoffing Democrats that we are, we do dearly love to be noticed by a duke. And when we are noticed by a monarch, it gives us softening of the brain for the rest of our lives. I've been noticed by a few. I've got three kings and a pair of emperors up my sleeve. Your Majesty, Mr. and Mrs. Samuel Clements. Mr. and Mrs. Clemens, we are pleased to welcome you to Britain after your sojourn in Europe. Oh, thank you, Your Majesty. You are a true consolidator of nations. Your delightful humor destroys national prejudices. Well, I certainly hope you think so after seeing tonight's performance, Your Majesty. We have no doubt, Mr. Clements. Well, let the show begin then. Announcing His Royal Highness King Arthur of Camelot and the noble Sir Lancelot. Her Royal Highness, Queen Guinevere, and her noble ladies-in-waiting. And the King's Prime Minister, the stranger from a far-off land of Connecticut who calls himself Yankee, but is known to us as Sir Buck. Kingdom prosper, Sir Boss. Not bad, Your Highness. I'm introducing several classy ideas that I think will speed up the modernization of the kingdom. For a start, your first newspaper. Newspaper? Sorry to know about it. Who are you? A page. A page? Go along, you're hardly a paragraph. Well, Sir Boss. I'm sure your newspaper is all very interesting, but we have our own time-honored traditions for carrying news. For example, the Lady Alessande is here to report on Sir Gawain and his search for the Holy Grail. Your report, Lady Alessande? And 
and it please you, sire, your noble knight, Sir Gawain, rode into a great forest and slew the gallant Sir Marhaus and rode swiftly away until he came to a great castle where dwelt a lovely damsel and Sir... Okay. Sandy, Sandy, you don't have to burn so much kindling to get your fire started. You'll never compete with my newspaper with that archaic kind of delivery. You gotta put some snap into it. Some snap? Hmm. Yes, uh, and a little beat. A little beat? Prithee, sir, I will try. And now, the story of Sir Gawain and his search for the Holy Grail. Forsooth, in truth, he slew the gallant youth. That's better. And then he had to scram a lot to get back home to Camelot. Alas, alas, he never did get back. For on the trip he spied a lady. Now, now the, the story is getting shady. shady. And I have to say, he's many miles away. And though I hate to spoil that tale, I think he's found a different trail. And so, in short, your knight is quite a sport. And frankly, sire, if you agree that knights are made for chivalry, I'd like a knight or two for me, and that is my report. Now, you're telling it how? You're telling it brown. Please selling it sadly. See, they're winging it free. You're ringing it free. are going, 
Pretty soon you won't have anyone else to be acquainted with but God. Well, I'd introduce you, but I think you'll be too busy getting reacquainted with Susie. Oh, I... I can hardly believe she'll be here in a few days. You see, Doubting Thomas, prayers are answered. Well, did you pray that one of the three novels I've written since we've come here would be a success? Yes. And uh, did you pray that the typesetter would be resurrected and get us out of debt? Yes. Someone isn't listening. No. Mm. no. Sometimes I think I'm going to have to get up on that lecture platform again. Oh, I know it might do some good. It might do some good to cut my head off, but I'd rather do good some other way. Papa? Papa! This telegram came for you while you were gone. It's from New York. Departure delayed. Susie slightly ill. Nothing of consequence. Recovery certain. Charles Langdon. I must go to her. It is one of the mysteries of our nature that a man, all unprepared, can receive a thunderstroke like that and live. If she had been given just three more days, we would have seen her alive. But we weren't to be granted that. We laid her to rest on an Elmira hill in Woodlawn Cemetery. On her stone, we inscribed a poem. Warm summer sun, shine kindly here. Warm southern wind, blow gently here. Green sod above, lie light, lie light. Good night, dear heart. Good night. Good night. Sam? Our hearts will never be whole again. But we have each other. We must go on. We must do our duty and find some way to pay our debts. Well, I'll lock myself up and write. That's all I really want to do anyway. Well, it'll take you three years to get a book ready for the publisher. You... You must accept the invitation from the lecture bureau, Sam. I will not go on that infernal lecture circuit again. It's not exactly the circuit. It's around the world. Oh, I don't care if it's around the moon. I hate dragging this old body and, and my entire family across the devil's universe to pay debts that weren't of my making and that were excused. But Sam, you're ultimately responsible. The creditors must be paid. What, what kind of a life will we have? Knowing that we owe money to the people who trusted us, we, we've got to see this through to the end. We've got to. Oh, my darling, you'll, you'll find the strength in you somehow. I know you will. And I'll be with you every inch of the way. Oh. 
All right. I'll go. I'll go. <laughs> Compliments are always embarrassing. You never know what to say. They, they don't inspire you with words. Now, I've received compliments a great many times, and they always embarrass me. I always feel like they don't say enough. I was sorry to see my name among the great authors because they have a sad habit of dying off. Chaucer is dead, Spencer is dead, so is Milton, and, and so is Shakespeare. And I'm not feeling very well myself. <laughs> Mr. Twain, Mr. Twain, sir. There are rumors in America that you have died. My paper has sent me here to confirm these reports. Tell your paper the reports of my death were greatly exaggerated. <laughs> Africa. We arrived by boat. It was hot. The only beverage in the ship that was passable was the butter. <laughs> and then there were the flies. Now, nothing is made in vain, but a fly comes very near it. And nothing seems to please the fly more than to be mistaken for a huckleberry. And if he's baked in a cake and palmed off on the unwary as a current, he dies happy. And the last penny has been paid. Let's go home. Should all acquaintance be forgotten? Happy New Year, Uncle. Happy turn of the century. Oh, You know, all these years, you have been the only editor I've ever trusted. Oh, Sam. Livy, it's true. Every time I failed to take your advice to change this or that sentence or, or eliminate that page, I've always come to regret it. Oh, I'm still on the pedestal, you. I, I'm sorry, Sam. I, I just need to sit down a minute. I, I think I'm getting old. I, I'm so out of breath, I am. Oh, nonsense. Why... You'll outlive me by 30 years. Well, that's not in your hands. No. No. It's, it's in the hands of the universities. They're the ones that are hastening me to my grave. The universities are hastening you to your grave? How is that? Well, here it is June again, and I, I see them conferring hundreds of honorary doctorates on other people, and never one to me. In these past 40 years, I've seen him distribute 10,000 doctorates and overlook me every time. Yes. You would have had stupendous fame here. If only you had been a foreigner. This neglect would have killed a less robust person than I am. It has shortened my life and weakened my constitution. 
I had no idea this was eating away at you. Thirty years, accumulation of bile and injured pride. And I thought I knew all your secrets. <laughs> well, now you do. <sighs> Except I've... I've probably never told you that I love you. Some years later, Florence became our home when Livy's condition worsened. I hoped the warmth would help her, but I watched her steadily decline. Sam, I, I want to read something to you, because I, I think it might serve as some consolation for not being recognized by a university again oh, this year. That secret old sore of mine. Well, it's... It's part of an article that Rudyard Kipling wrote when he got back to India about his visit to Elmira. And it says, Once, Mark Twain put his hand on my shoulder. It was an investiture of the Star of India. Blue silk and trumpets, a diamond studded jewel, all complete. And if hereafter, in the changes and the chances of this mortal life, I, I fall to cureless ruin. I will tell the superintendent of the workhouse that Mark Twain once put his hand on my shoulder. And he shall give to me a room to myself and a double allowance of pauper's tobacco. You don't think I'm going to die, do you, Sam? I don't want to die. Livy, uh, if it comforts you, lean on the Christian faith. Oh, I can't, Sam. I haven't any left. My dear, if you are to be lost, I want to be lost with you. Oh, Vivi. Vivi, forgive me. Forgive me. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Livy, oh, Livy. Livy. Oh, no, no. Don't leave me. Let me go first. Please, don't leave me. An hour ago this day, June 5th, the best heart that ever beat for me and mine went silent out of this house. 
and I am as one who wanders and has lost his way. She was my breath. She was my life. And while she lived, I was richer than any other person in the world. And now, I am a pauper without peer. Sam? Sam? Charlie, I can't reproduce Livy's face in my mind's eye. You are 70 today. I will not say, O king, live forever, but, O king, live as long as you like. I hope I'm doing as well when I'm your age. You won't. <laughs> I have achieved my 70 years by sticking strictly to a scheme of life that would kill anybody else. For example, I expect you exercise every day. Well, I have been walking down East Hill lately, rather than up. Well, there you are, you see. The only exercise I ever take is when I act as a pallbearer at the funerals of friends who exercise regularly. <laughs> well, I don't know when I've seen you look better. Oh, Charlie, never waste a lie. You never know when you might need it. Mr. Clemens, Mr. Clemens. Yes, I'm here. There's a cablegram come for you, sir. Well, I don't want to see it, Katie. They always bring bad news. Shall I read it for you, Sam? Well, if you like. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Oxford University would confer a degree of Doctor of Letters on you on June 26th, but personal presence necessary. Cable me whether you can come White Law Reed. Oh, that doesn't sound like a disaster to me, Sam. No, Susan. Uh, a doctor of letters from the world's greatest institution of learning is not a disaster. Uh, it's the highest recognition possible. And it's going to a barefoot boy from Missouri. Who left school when he was 12. Yes. I'll never let school and interfere with my education. <laughs> Katie. Send a cable and, and say I will come with the greatest pleasure. Yeah, when, when you book my passage, leave me seven days to say goodbye to old friends. I shan't meet them again without their halos. There's one or two I shan't meet with halos. And I'm sorry about that. They were the best of the flock. Uh, but, sir, you said you'd never cross the ocean again. I'd be willing to journey to Mars for this Oxford degree. I can't turn down the final credential for immortality. Doctor of Letters from Oxford. Did you hear that, Livy? Isn't it a wonder? Rodin, the degree of Doctor of Civil Law. Your sculptures have brought beauty and majesty to all Europe. Camille Saint-Saëns, the degree of Doctor of Music. Your gifts of melody and sense of form have broadened our musical horizons. Rudyard Kipling, the degree of Doctor of Humanities. Your poems and novels have celebrated the finest achievements of the British Empire. Samuel Langhorne Clemens, Mark Twain, the degree of Doctor of Letters. Hey.
final chapter. I shall not write again. I am 70 and would nestle in the chimney corner, smoke my cigar and take my rest. And I shall endeavor to live the rest of my life so that when I die, even the undertaker will be sorry. <laughs> now if I was able to reach out there and shake that undertaker's hand, I'd ask him to please remember, I have never written for critical praise, only for the approval of the people. And I have nothing to leave you but a few friends of mine. Tom Sawyer, you've played me tricks enough. When I say I'll learn a man the river, I mean it. I'll learn him or I'll kill him. I am ear for these. Does a boy get a chance to whitewash a fence every day? And it please you, sire, your noble knight departed from Camelot. Look up at the sky, all speckled with stars. Said I never would come home again, till I could come home in glory. There's a place where a man can be free and never feel troubles or woe.